So this is uh, Drupal 8's multilingual APIs. This is a coding and development track session, so we're gonna talk about code. Uh, we've had uh, several sessions around multilingual at different Drupal cons, and we focused a lot on site building experience, and we even built a whole workshop around building a multilingual Drupal 8 site. So if you're interested in figuring out all the site building goodness, then drupal8multilingual.org has um, a page with uh, handout text, has a lot of um, um, video content, a simple distribution that you can install and try out a pre-created version of a multilingual site and just walk through the steps. Uh, so that's, if you're looking at the site building things, we are here for looking at the coding part of multilingual in Drupal 8. So I am uh, Gabor Hoichi, and if you've been to the keynote in the morning, there's people have problems with their names being incompatible with systems, and I have the same problem. So this is a badge from uh, Batcamp. This is um, uh, my profile at uh, DrupalCon Munich, I think. This is um, schedule at DrupalCon Munich. And Twitter sent me this exciting email a couple of weeks ago. So. So the problem we've been starting from in Drupal 8 is multilingual was an afterthought in Drupal 7. So there's a lot of multilingual modules and you can set them up in the right order with the right settings and they work, but it's an afterthought. The system does not know about multilingual, is not aware of multilingual in many ways, and it may or may not work. Um, so that's the problem in seven, and we wanted to, um, wanted to solve that in eight. And I'm presenting this here, but this is the work of around 1,300 contributors. So this is a start of the list, and it continues on until here. So uh, they contributed reviews, feedback, user testing, screenshots, UIs, uh, tests, uh, whatever, all kinds, of, um, all kinds of other feedback that made this possible. So where we started from in Drupal 7, and this is a very short summary of the site building aspects of what we have, and I think it's also useful for just seeing what, what kind of development approach we, uh, we did, is that you have Drupal core, which is in itself not really aware of language, so we have a locale module which you enable, then you can manage the list of languages on the site, and also translate the user interface to some languages. But locale module works with PO files that you need to manually upload to Drupal 7 through the user interface. So if you have 100 modules and 10 languages, then you need to manually identify the versions of your modules, manually download 100 times 10, so 1,000 PO files manually download from localized.drupal.org to your desktop, and then manually upload 1,000 files through the Drupal user interface that doesn't really work. So we built a module for that localization update that automates identifying the version number, uh, downloading the files, importing the files, et cetera. So that automates the user interface translation. And when you want to deal with uh, translating your content, we have the content translation module that creates copies of your content. Now when you create content in Drupal 7, you can also edit the menu items for that content and the taxonomy terms for that content but content translation does not allow you to translate menu items or taxonomy terms. So you install the IATNAN module suite. That allows you to translate menu items and taxonomy terms. And then you are like, well, okay, but I still cannot translate the emails that are sent out to my users or, um, or, um, or the uh, site name even. So then you install the variable module suite which comes with several modules. So now you have the possibility to translate the emails that are sent out to users as well as menu items, taxonomy terms. And then you have views, and none of these will allow you to translate views. So then you download the ITN and views module and install that as well. And then you have web form, and none of these will allow you to translate web forms. So you download the web form localization module, which has a totally different name than everything else. It's not ITN and web form or web form ITN, it's web form localization. 
And then you have an e-commerce store, and none of these allow you to translate e-commerce stores. So now you download the entity translation module, which is great because that it allows you to translate your store, but you already have the content translation module for translating other things, and entity translation actually could translate all the things that you translated with content translation. So now you have two ways to translate nodes, NED translation and content translation, and some of your content types may actually be using content translation while other content types may be using NED translation. And then NED translation also supports uh, translating taxonomy terms. So now you have IATN to translate taxonomy terms and NED translation to translate taxonomy terms. So the features overlap uh, in some ways. And I actually run into this uh, um, with, a, uh, with a support request that somebody was like trying to translate their taxonomy terms with IATN and it didn't work. And then we looked at the user interface and it turns out that they are using NED translation for translating the taxonomy term, but they used to use IATN to translate the taxonomy term. So it was in the database and it had the user interface in IATN to translate it, but it was not used anymore. So they've had like working in a user interface that did not actually have an effect on the system, so it's very frustrating. And then, uh, if you try to use NED translation for translating your nodes, it's not really possible because node titles are impossible to translate. So you also download the title module and enable the title module, and now you can translate your titles of your nodes. So um, Drupal 7, as, as it can be seen, multilingual is an afterthought. And still, a lot of people use Drupal 7 to build multilingual sites, and they are very successful with that, but we wanted to lower the barrier significantly here and just make this easier. So, in Drupal 8, the idea is there's only four things, and they are very extensible, and they apply to everything in the system. So, the first thing is language. So, the problem in Drupal 7 is we don't know the language of most things. We have no idea. So we need to make assumptions. Um, so instead in Drupal 8, we wanted to know the language of everything. So we know the language of your menus. We know the language of your menu items, one by one. We know the language of your views, each view one by one. We know the language of every user. We know the language of every node. We know the language of, of your user email settings. Uh, and everything basically. So we wanted to track language and everything because then we can translate to other languages and we can track what's in what language we can translate uh, from the community all the things that are included in the software, etc. So that allows us to do fun things and we need to track language even before you think about translating anything because you set up a site, you install 100 modules and then in two years you decide to add the second language and now we need to know uh, language of everything you've done so far. So we need, so Drupal keeps track of language even if um, you don't actively enable the language feature. And then there's uh, several other improvements here on how language is selected, et cetera, but uh, we are not going into that here. And then the second thing that we did in Drupal 8 is a separate interface translation module. So it's now separate from uh, language management. And here we've included the localization update feature by default. So that it down, so when you install Drupal, the, uh, the first screen is going to be a language selector, and then from there it downloads the translations, imports them, and everything is translated. So um, so it's built into the core of the system, and then every module you enable, update, do whatever. They're going to download the translation updates. They're going to download the new translations. If you add a new language, it's going to download the translations for that language. So um, it's very uh, integrated, and we've improved the user interface of interface translation itself to make it easier to touch up on that. We made English customizable as user interface text. We, um, we um, protect those customizations, so when you update from the community, they are not overwritten, so we've made a lot of improvements in this area. And for content language, so the problem I've explained is we've had too many solutions for content translation in Drupal 7 and they were competing and overlapping and have all kinds of other problems. So what we did instead is we have one unified content translation solution in 8. It's called content translation, but it's not the content translation solution that was in Drupal 7. So we threw out that solution and instead brought in the entity translation module and improved it in ways to make it as flexible as possible. So now everything is translatable 
Every field is translatable on your content. There's no need for a title module or any other special modules. And so basically you can set up um, your content translation anywhere between having every field translated, which is practically the same as it was in Drupal 7 with the core module, or some of the fields translated, which is the same as it was with Entity Translation. So it's one model, but it supports whatever you need, and it applies to everything in the system from e-commerce to user profiles to uh, taxonomy terms, menu items, all kinds of things. And then we have configuration, a new configuration system in Drupal 8 that applies to everything that is in configuration. So it applies to views, it applies to menus, it applies to uh, user email settings, site name, rules, field settings, all of those things. And we have a unified translation solution for that too. So whatever is in configuration, uh, your translation solution will apply to that. So one caveat here, if you are building a module for Drupal 8 and you, for, and you need to track your own data. You need to store your own data with your module. If you do not use the content translation system or, or the content, content system or the configuration system, you have your own database, you have your own data storage system, we do not have a translation solution for you, okay? So if you use your own data storage and not content or config, then you're on your own, okay? You need to solve your own problems. We did solve problems for content entity and configuration systems. So let's start with language. So the way language works on the API level is we have a language manager that is used to manage the list of languages on your site. And as I've said, even if you do not have any language um, features enabled on the site, you don't have the language module enabled, there is still a language manager on your site. Uh, the built-in language manager is called language manager. And once you enable the, um, the language module, then it's replaced with the configurable language manager. So th the reason for this is when you don't have language features enabled on the site, we still want to track language data on everything you do. So we need to have a system that acts as, as supporting language, even if you don't specifically want multiple languages. So we have this language manager that assumes that you wanted to use English and um, provides English as the page language, provides English as the language that you save content in, et cetera, et cetera. So until you enable the language module, Drupal assumes you are English, your site is English, and is doing, maintaining everything in English and keeping track of every configuration and content and everything in English. And once you enable the language module, then the language manager becomes the configurable language manager, and there you can enable multiple languages, and then you can uh, have uh, those languages assigned to things. So this language manager is a service that has methods that you can call. So get languages is the method to get all the languages on the site. And if you do not have configurable languages, then these are the three languages that are available. So even if you do not have language module enabled, Drupal knows about three languages. Uh, one is UND, not specified. The other is uh, ZXX, not applicable. So we have these two languages because people were confused about UND, so we duplicated it. So you are more confused now. <laughs> Twice as confused. So. Um, yeah, so not specified is uh, supposed to be used for cases when the thing may have language, but you don't know what the language is. So if you have a Word document that has text in there and you've uploaded it and you want to assign a language to the Word document, but you don't know, then you would assign UND. If you have a photograph of, you have a selfie with Dries, um, that does not have language. It doesn't make sense to assign a language to a selfie with trees. So that's not applicable. So it's not applicable to assign language to that thing, okay? So that's the difference. So now we can make a difference of this may have language, but I don't know, and it doesn't make sense for this to have language. And then we have English built in. If you enable language module, then you get the configurable language manager, and then you can drop English if you want. English is not required in the system anymore, unlike Drupal 7. And then you can configure whatever you want. So in this case, I configured Hungarian and Italian. 
And these are stored, the configurable languages, as well as the built-in languages are stored in the configuration system itself. So if you export your configuration, these will be found under language.entity.thelanguagecode.yaml. So all of these will be there, and the built-in ones are locked, so you don't get to see them on the user interface when you are editing the list of languages, but they are still there. And the other ones are not locked, so you can get to see them and delete them and edit their names and do other fun things. So if you have a project that you need to have other special languages, then you can ship with other special languages as uh, default configuration in your project. Uh, as language.entity. whatever the language code is, and mark them as logged. If you want to ship with um, uh, configurable languages, then you would ship with them the same way, just don't mark them logged. You can also create languages very easily in code. So um, the configurable language is the class for configurable languages. You can say create from language code fr and save, and then you get to have the file for language.entity.fr.yaml. So this works off of metadata from Drupal, already knows about predefined languages, so it's just gonna fill in the data, the language name, the direction of the language, et cetera, from the predefined data. And then you can do the same, delete the language, and get rid of it. So languages are objects in Drupal 8, very easy to handle. There's a language manager that deals with the, uh, listing them, and um, very easy to create and delete them. And then language manager also deals with selecting the language for the page or for the request or for whatever occasion you need. And that's the other important method of language manager is get current language. Uh, by default, this is gonna tell you about the interface language selected for the request. So whatever, based on the configuration that the administrator set up, is gonna tell you about the language selected for the page. So if you wanna do something based on this, uh, like one of our client projects, they needed to custom translate some things in the system based on this language. It's very easy to get this uh, language and then use it in whatever third party system to get the data you need. This could also be used to get other languages like the content language negotiated for the page, etc. So that's for language. So in summary, languages are objects that can be created and deleted very easily. They are stored in the configuration system if you have configurable languages or just happen to be predefined if you don't have language module enabled. And we track language on everything which we'll see one by one in the other systems. So you get to see how that works. Second thing is interface language. So interface translation, you may get to know the T function in Drupal 7 and this still totally works fine in Drupal 8. T function, it works. It didn't change. Now we'll see that it totally changed entirely, but this actually works and is gonna mostly get you the expected result that you wanted. So, um, yeah. But it's not really suggested to be used like this. So the problem of using the global T function is you are assuming that you, your environment is able to translate something. Is, a global, is an assumption about what Drupal has globally in the system for you. And it's not a best practice to just call out to the global system and ask for things. So this is logically what the T function does, right? So you have your logic and you would call out to um, your environment. So you would say, I wanna do this translation to this string and please global environment give me the translation. And it's not very good because you need, you make these assumptions about your environment that may or may not be true. And also, it's is hard to make your logic self-contained if you depend on all of, that, all of that environment, it's hard to get it tested. So what Drupal 8 moved to very heavily is dependency injection where, it sounds very scary, but these errors are just moved backwards. And instead of we calling out to the external environment, we get all of the services that we need and then we use the services, service references as if they were available locally. That's the simplest version of dependency injection explanation that I can do. So instead of calling out to the global environment and say, please global environment, do this for me, we have the services that we need um, injected. We have the dependencies that we need uh, referenced so we can call them and ask them to do stuff for us. 
So most of the places in Drupal 8, you would not do T um, English text, but you would do this T English text. So it would be in a class that has a T method that you can use to translate things, and it would work the same way as the global T. So the way we do these is there's uh, the string translation trait that provides the T method and the, and the translation manager service and everything encapsulated. So if you have your own class, then you can just use the string translation trait. If you are writing a form or you're writing a block or whatever other thing, the form base, the block base, and a lot of other base classes already include string translation uh, trait. So you have your string translation features at your fingertips. So no reason to uh, worry about that. So what this allows us is to make this um, testing much easier and have dependencies ex explicit um, in the system. So I've also said that the T function works the same way as before. So the same way as before would be that you get a string that's the translation of the string that you provided, but that's not the case in Drupal 8. So you can also do this. So you say, translate this English text to me, and then you call a method on the translation. So what actually happens in Drupal 8 is the T, T um, method returns an object instance. So it's a translatable markup. And if you print it out or use it in some string context, then it is translated at the time when you use it as a string. Okay, so it's not translated when you call the T function. It creates an object that's like this string needs to be translated into this language with these options, and it's translated later when it needs to be translated. So that's very cool for a lot of reasons. For one, it allows Drupal code to use the T method way before the, even the system is available to translate those things uh, because the actual usage of the string happens much later. It also optimizes a lot of these translations because Drupal uses the T function all, all kinds of places. And the actual string that is the output of the T function may not actually be used at the end in the output. So it may be altered out somehow or it may be not even appear on the UI or something. So this actually as a speed optimization as well as allows us to use the T method more uh, than before. So you get a translatable markup instance that you can call fun methods like get option or get original string and all kinds of other things. So later on you can inspect what's actually in there. You can create other T instances of that, et cetera. So, but if you don't want to do that, whatever the T function returns is safe to use in form arrays and all kinds of other things because it's um, cast to a string at the right time later on. So you don't need to worry about this if you don't want to worry about this, okay. And then format plural, same thing. Um, there's not even a global format plural function anymore, so it's hard to not use something else. The T function is still there globally, but the format plural is removed, so you need to use uh, this format plural, which is also included with the string translation trait. And in JavaScript, not much change. Drupal T, Drupal format plural. Uh, this didn't change much. Then Drupal 7 had all of these special places that have special translation needs on their own. So in Drupal 7, if you, have, if you go to hook menu, the title and description keys never took a T because if you translate them there, then Drupal cannot cache them in the original language and then it cannot translate them later on into whatever language needed, etc. So it's a whole set of pain there. And Drupal 8 is not any different, except, uh, in fact, in Drupal 8, we now have these YAML files, so it's not even possible to like put in code to translate this for me. So in Drupal 8, for menu uh, links, for example, we have uh, these YAML files, locale.links.menu.yaml, which is the user interface translation page, by the way, um, and we have the title and description keys there that take text. So these are special keys, the POTX module that does the string extraction knows about these keys, and Drupal in PHP logic translated these, translate these strings later on, so you don't actually need to care about uh, using the T function here or anything like that. So this works for menu links, for route titles, and all kinds of other things that are defined in plugin YAML uh, files. And if you write your own module and you need to use your own plugin and that needs to have its own YAML files for um, settings, 
then you need to implement the POTX uh, YAML uh, parsing format so it understands these keys as well. So your strings will end up on localized.drupal.org. If you don't implement your own plugins with your own YAML files, then you don't need to care about that because these are all predefined and these just work and are translatable uh, out of the gate. So one thing that is still kept as is for interface translation is this is English to some other language. So interface translation is always from English to something else. So if you use I18N module in seven, I18N reuses string translation for taxonomy terms, menu items, and all kinds of other things. And there, it allows you to translate from other languages to whatever. Uh, Drupal 8 does not do that at all. So the configuration translation is totally separate from interface translation. So interface translation is only for things that you hardwire in your code, in PHP, YAML files, these things, and it's always English to something else. So Drupal deals with that that way. So for content language, so Drupal 8 uses content entities for a lot of things. So nodes are content entities. Menu items are content entities. User profiles are content entities. Taxonomy terms are content entities. Uh, contact form, uh, forms are, are, are content entities. So we needed a way to specify which content entities could be made translatable. So content entities have configuration to, for you to make them either translatable or not. But you as developers need to be able to tell if your content entity makes sense to be translatable at all. So content entities are defined with their own classes and they have annotations which include a way for you to specify if this, this content entity could even be translated at all. So you can say translatable true and you should include a language code entity key for your um, content entity. And you should have at least one field that could be translated in some way. And then your content entity may be translatable. Okay, so this just says that the site configuration may configure this content entity to be translatable. This does not mean that it is translatable. It means that it may be configured to be translatable. So you have your entity type, in this case, nodes, and then there are fields on entity types. And what I said is you don't need title module anymore because there's all the fields that, all the fields are managed with the same system and they may be translatable. And that's true, but there are still two types of fields in Drupal. There are base fields and configurable fields, and they are a little bit different for translatability. Base fields, they have a, they, you define base fields hard-coded in your class for your entity type in the base field definitions method. And each field has a set translatable method where you can say this base field is translatable. Again, this says that this base field may be configurable to be translatable. So if you set it to be not translatable, it means that nobody ever will be able to set it to be translatable. But saying set translatable true does not mean that it will actually end up being always translatable because this is configurable for per site, okay? So this just says that I opt into the possibility of translation. So that's for base fields. And for uh, configurable fields, you don't need to do anything special about them because the system supports the configurability of, config of fields to be translatable, configurable fields to be translatable. So you can opt out of your node type being, of your, sorry, entity type being translatable. You can opt out of your base field being translatable but you cannot opt out your configurable field being translatable, although your configurable field will not be translatable if the parent entity type is not translatable. And finally, there is one more complicated case. If you have a multi-column field type that may have uniquely separatable values, in this case, an image field, then you can use annotations on that field type to further divide your field to translation options. 
So in this case, the image field says that, that I have multiple columns and my target ID width and height columns belong to one group that I call the file. And I have a column called alt that I call the alt. So this makes it possible for Drupal to individually make your file and your alt text configurable to be translatable. But these are just defaults for translatability or not because configurable fields are always, uh, tr always could always be configured to be translatable. So, um, so you can set up uh, column groups that allow Drupal to go on the subfield level and say, I want to only translate part of this field. In this case, you want to translate maybe the alt text, but you want to keep the same file is a good use case for stores. So if you sell the same product, but you want to have separate text on them per language, then you would use the same image field. And this is how it's coded on the field definition. Okay, so that's the how you define what will be translatable. And then there's entity language API. It's the same entity API that we've seen for configurable languages. You have the node class that can load a node for you. In this case, node 42. And the node knows about their translations. Very fancy. So you can say node get translation Hungarian and it gets you a Hungarian translation. And it's the same node, ob the same behavior for the node translation as it was for the node object. So now you have a translation object that you can do the same with you can treat it as the same node as before. Um, if you want to do language negotiation on your translation, so you don't know what language you want, but you want to have the same language that was negotiated for your page, then the entity repository has the get translation from context method that you can use. It's pretty much in the weeds, but it's very useful if you don't know the concrete language, you can go in and ask for uh, a negotiated language for this node that will actually pick a language that's available on the node and get you that language. And then it's overall very nice. So you can get back the untranslated entity from the translated entity, which gets you the original language for this entity. You can ask for the language of the current translation of the entity or get the list of translation languages or ask if it has a Hungarian translation or add a new Hungarian translation or remove a Hungarian translation. So it's an intelligent object that you can deal with and add and remove translations and deal with translations. It's very easy to use. It's much more powerful than Drupal 7 where it was just like this anonymous array that you need to navigate somehow with obscure methods. It's very hard to do there. And then if you don't actually, so, this API is, I think, is very great, but you may not even use this API for some of your simpler tasks because now in Drupal 8 we've included the views module and that allows you to build out lists and tables and galleries and filters and all kinds of fun things with just the view so you don't actually need to sit down and code anything. And, what, and that's very easy to do because you build this out and then you can export it as configuration and ship with your module and you don't need to write a single line of code. So it's very easy to do language things in views because in views we support language on both of the responsibilities of views. So with the query building part on the first column we support language uh, filtering for example. So you can say I want to filter the language in this view for things that are um, translated in the language of the page. And this, this is the default front page, by the way, as a view in Drupal 8. And then on the rendering side, which is the second column, we support language rendering as well. So the, whatever the query found, you can configure independently what the rendering language is gonna be. And by default, the rendering language is whatever was found but you can also render in some other language. Like you can render the original language version of the thing that was found, or you can render some specific translation, or render it in the user's prefer preferred language, or all kinds of other things. So it's very easy to do blocks and lists and galleries and tables and all kinds of other things with this. And uh, a lot of the admin pages are views, so the node admin page is a view, for example. It's, you can very easily clone that page and create a translation dashboard for your translators without writing a line of code. I think that's pretty powerful. So that's for content translation. 
So what you can see there is content translation tracks the language of your content. So what I, how I summarize that is this translation X to Y. So you can translate from whatever language to whatever other language that you want. It does not need to be in a specific source language or need to be a specific target language. And it's intelligent object, so just load the object and then you can ask it about its translations and then load a translation, add a translation, remove a translation. It's very fancy. Um, so this applies to nodes, menu items, taxonomy terms, user profiles, blah, 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 a lot of things in core. And it also applies to all kinds of contrib things like rules and e-commerce and all the things that are using the content entity API. So there's one API to use for everything. It supports translation of base fields and configurable fields. It supports subfield translatability for cases where you need that and you have full control as a developer over all those things um, as well. So finally, let's look into uh, config translation. So config translation, we did a similar thing. So in Drupal 8, configuration files that are shipped with uh, projects are in their config slash install slash whatever dot yaml. In this case, system maintenance dot yaml is the default maintenance message setting in Drupal core. And each configuration file individually has a lang code key, as a reserved key in the configuration system. So this key specifies the language of this file, the whole file. So in this case, this file is only a message setting for maintenance messages, which in this case we say is English, because it is English by default. So that's, um, that's in the configuration file. And now we need to be able to translate the message. So the question is, how do we know that the message is even translatable? Because the same configuration system is used for views. If you look at a view, it's not gonna fit on this slide ever. So even with like two point fonts or I don't know. So there's a lot of stuff in views and you can only translate a limited number of them. So we have a system to explain what's translatable in this configuration. And the system is actually used for all kinds of other things as well in Drupal, including uh, your deployment of your configuration. So it's much more useful than just translation, but it was introduced for translation. So that's the configuration schema system. And it has some uh, base types, like text says, um, or it has some base types like string, and it has some extended types like text, where it says text is a string that is translatable. And then it has some more complex types like associative mappings, like config object, which is an associative mapping that has a language code key. So the previous slide, system maintenance YAML is a configuration object. It's an associative array with the language code key. So that's defined as a config object. And then we'll use the text type to identify the message. So this is defined in the system modules configuration schema and that says that system maintenance is a configuration object. So it's an associative array that has a language code key predefined for me. And by the way, I also have a message key that is text. So it's a translatable string, okay? So we have the configuration schema that's used to explain the structure of your configuration. And this allows the translation system to go in and parse this and tell which keys are translatable. This is also used to typecast the configuration to the right type so your deployments are nice. And it's also used for testing whether your configuration is actually, um, whether like the tests produce the actual configuration expected. So it's used for a lot of things, but it's very useful for translation. So the way this works is the configuration system has the system maintenance YAML file in the active storage in configuration. And then we have a Hungarian translation override that says the message in Hungarian is this and this. And then we have an Italian override that says the message in Italian is this and this. So the config system works with translation overrides that are, um, that are um, stored in these uh, files. So all of these are in the active configuration system. So these are deployed to your live site with your configuration, but they only store keys that are required for the translation. So what happens 
when this is used in the system is Drupal loads the translation that's needed at the time and it merges the files together and then you have a translation, okay? So for example, you use the configuration API very simply like this. You load the system maintenance message from the config system and then you get the message key. In this case, the config system will use the interface language negotiated for the page, load the override for the interface language, maybe Hungarian, merge the Hungarian on top of the original configuration and now you get a Hungarian message. You have no way to tell if Hungarian was applied or not, okay? Because the configuration system supports whatever overrides, okay? So in this case, overrides apply in from whatever system. You may be using domain module, you may be using organic groups, you may have global settings overrides, all of those will apply, okay? So this configuration system has a priority um, list for overrides in terms of which applies first and which applies last. So if you have a translation override, it may still be overridden by a domain override or by an organic group override, depending on their priorities. So you can um, configure that, that priority to uh, configure your site as needed. But we don't really, like, it's hard to know whether the, you get the translated object or not. And you may get a half translated object that also has organic group overrides and then domain overrides. So it's a lot of fun. Um, if you don't want to have, or if you want to have a specific language override, then what you can do is very convoluted is not really how Drupal 8 should be, but unfortunately we didn't get to anywhere better than this, is you need to change global state, which I just explained, that is not good. So, the, so there's uh, the language manager that maintains the configuration override language as well. So you can say, please give me the config override language so I can remember it for later. And then you say, set the config override language to whatever I want, and then do stuff with configuration in that language, because now you get that language overrides applied all the time, and then you set it back to what it was before. So this is not nice, but this is what we have. Uh, the reason it's not nice is because the config system needs to be agnostic of overrides, because it may have any kinds of overrides, all kinds of things. So you cannot really go into the config system and say, I want to have this language override. It's not even aware that there may be language overrides to generic system. However, the language manager is aware that there are language overrides and it maintains this for you. So that's what you can do. If you don't want to have overrides at all, or you want to access a specific override, we have APIs for that. So config, Drupal config applies all overrides, everything, global overrides, domain overrides, everything. If you don't want any overrides to apply, then there's uh, the config factory has a get editable method that you get the original raw unmodified whatever was in your active storage configuration and there's no overrides. So this is useful because if you actually want to make changes to your configuration, you need to get this. Because if you get the other one and then you change something and then you save it back, then you may leak some stuff from your organic groups or for your domains or for your translations into your original configuration. And that's bad, that's unpredictable, anything could happen. So what, in, what happens actually in Drupal 8 if you do the first line and then try to save it is you get an exception and you are told that no, 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 you don't do that. So it's not possible to save back things from Drupal config. It is possible to save back things from um, get editable because that gets you original configuration, okay? So because you want to save back to original, that's what you use. And finally, if you want to access the actual language override, as I've said, the language manager knows about language overrides. So you say language manager, get, give, uh, get me the language override in Hungarian for system maintenance. And then I can set whatever I want, the message to something else, and then save it and it works. So you can access specific overrides one by one, you can access the original configuration and you can just load the configuration in whatever overrides apply at that point in time. So those are the separate ways to uh, access configuration. 
So the difference between configuration and, and content is, or the similarity is that you can create configuration and content in whatever language you want originally, and you can translate it to whatever language you want. Okay, so config you can create in Italian and translate it to French and then create another one in Hungarian and translate it to English. It doesn't matter. The main difference is content is intelligent objects that know about their translations. They only support language variants. So they know about their translations and it, it can support them. And configuration, the use case was not possible to support because there may be domains and organic groups and all kinds of other things. So it's more like dump arrays that are merged in together and then put into an object for you. So we don't really know what's actually applied there and what happened. So you need to live with that, unfortunately. So that's a summary of all the APIs. And once again, I'd like to thank all of these people who worked out these uh, solutions for you. And wanted to call your attention to Drupal 8's possibilities because although some of these APIs may not be so nice, Drupal 8 now allows us to add new APIs and make backwards compatible changes to APIs. So we can add a totally new, much nicer, whatever API we want and can introduce that and modules can start using that and we can deprecate the old API later on. So uh, it's possible to improve this however much we want in Drupal 8 and we don't need to wait for Drupal 9. So if you didn't like something, then please come to uh, the sprint on Friday and on the weekend, and there's people working on these things to, uh, to make them better. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Christian personally for some of these uh, slides and some of these examples. So I, I uh, used his previous session for uh, some of the content entity stuff. And that's it, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, one thing that I was not quite uh, was not quite clear was if you install and uh, you have you have the language selection in the in the first slide, it will install and set the language selector to that language, and all the content and all the everything will be stored in that language and not in English like it used to be or undefined. So that's true. Yes. Okay. Yes, so when you install in Italian, then all the configuration that you have in the system will be uh, Langcode IT, mm -hmm. and they may contain English text. So a lot of the configuration, so Drupal 8 has a lot of things in configuration. Your user roles, your input formats, your views, field settings, content types, all of them. And uh, Drupal 8 has magic. So what it does is it updates the configuration files to Langcode IT. And then a local module comes in and it looks, looks at it and it's like, okay, it's, it's Langcode IT, but it's still the English text. So I go, I go in and I look at my interface translations if there's something translations for the default configurations. And then it puts in the translation for, for the translatable keys. So all the default configuration that ships with core and contributed modules is originally in English. And what happens is when you install them, we, um, we override the lang code to the site uh, language, and then we put in the, the, put in the translation from localized.drupal.org. So if you have an Italian site and you go, uh, go into views, you're gonna edit the view in Italian as it's originally on your, as it, uh, as it is now on your system because the locale module translated it from localized.drupal.org. Yeah, but uh, you know the big question was actually in order if you install it and you don't if you configure it right away, it won't like in D seven it will store every sorry everything in English, mm -hmm. and but you really have an Italian site so you know it will be hard when you then decide okay I need to make my site multilingual so I will enable all the modules but all my content my Italian content is actually marked as English. Yeah, okay. here, no, it's marked as Italian, so, English, so if you install in Italian, there's no English installed on the system, English is not even added, so like it's not even an option to create English things because you didn't want to have English, you wanted Italian. Thank you for that. Sure, thank you for people who made it happen. Okay, the question is, uh, if you install Italian and on the content you just write English and you save it and is it, is gonna be translated to Italian or not? 
You type you, in English, but yeah. how the system knows, okay, this, this, this ABC is English or is Italian. So you type a sentence in English, you save your note, is going to be translated in, in Italian or not? Yeah, so I think the question was, you, you enter your content Thanks. and you save it in English, and how is it going to be Italian at the yes. end? So, so, um, you, so as, on a site, you can configure your content to be translatable. So first off, well, so first off, you can configure your uh, content to be able to track separate languages. So you say, I want note, one the, one the uh, page note type to support multiple languages, you can configure that. And then it will have a language selector on the note type. So you can say this is English or Italian. Okay. And then it's saved in English originally, as you've explained for this example, but it could be saved in whatever other language. And then you can also configure that um, note type page in this example to support translation. So you also configure it to support translation, which will enable the translation tab on the node. Okay. And then if you go to the translation tab, it lists all the languages that are configured on the site, and then you can manually translate to those languages. Drupal 8 does not come with automated support for translating your English to Italian. Oh. Uh, so if you are looking at automating that or integrating with a system that automates that, then people sitting behind there are working for Lingotech that they are in that business. Okay. Um, so and they're going to do this magically for you. You just add Italian and everything shows no, up so in Italian. No, so that means so we, it's going to be a tab and you type it in you know, yes. Italian and you save it. So that is, okay, thank yeah. you. So it's a tab that says translations. It lists all your languages and you can add the Italian there. You say add Italian translation. It loads up the same form, that same visual okay. form that you created the node with and you can translate it to okay. Italian there. Thank you. Sure. Are there any problems with uh, exporting uh, overrides to YAML files for uh, exporting them to another site? Exporting. So the question was, are there any problems exporting overrides? Um, to another site. To another From local environment to the environment, yeah. environment, for example. That's a better question, or well, that's a different question. Mm -hmm. So the question was if there are any problems with exporting overrides from a dev environment to a live environment. Uh, I'm not aware. Um, so all the overrides are stored within the configuration system. So when you export your configuration, you get all the, all the original configuration as well as the overrides in one package. There's a subdirectory for overrides called languages and then um, the language name and so this one, so this is basically the directory structure in the export that you have. So you have the file name and then you have a languages directory uh, slash language code slash the same file name as the other one. So you get this and then the same thing could be imported to your other environment and just used like that. So I, I'm not aware of problems, but if anybody are, are aware, then I'm happy to hear about it. Okay, um, thanks for coming and enjoy Drupal 8.